Merrimack Valley region. <laughs> now I'm being recorded. Uh, we were established in 1959, and since then we've acquired a deep knowledge and appreciation for the region that so many call home. Uh, and on the topic of homes, in 2017, MVPC partnered with the town of North Andover to study the housing landscape in the community and produce a housing production plan. Uh, with all the conversations about housing that we've uh, seen occurring and happening today, we decided to partner with the town once again and with Mass Housing Partnership to facilitate this housing forum. Uh, we hope that the folks watching this event uh, will come away with an understanding of the housing needs and challenges facing North Andover residents uh, so that we can all move forward with a shared vision that benefits the whole town. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Nate Robertson, our community and economic development planner, and he is going to guide us uh, through, the re through the rest of tonight's forum. So thank you very much and uh, take it away, Nate. All right. Thanks, Tony. Um, and hey, folks, welcome to the North Andover Housing Forum. As Tony said, uh, introduce me. My name is Nate Robertson, and I'm the community and economic development planner for the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. And we were really happy to partner with the town of North Andover and Mass Housing Partnership to put on this forum today. Talking about our homes and our community um, can be deeply personal, um, and uh, and it's an important topic for everybody. Uh, because of this, there's a lot of passion around the issue. So our goal in putting this forum is, is to provide a little background on, on the work that's been done to date and a platform for local folk, folks to tell their story. Um, and here's what you can expect from tonight. We're gonna to try to make this as interactive as possible. So we'll start with some questions for the audience just so we know who's in attendance. Um, we'll be hearing some stories from North Andover residents. Mass Housing Partnership will be walking us through some frequently asked questions about housing. You'll hear about the North Andover Housing Production Plan with some updated information that we've included. And you'll also hear from the town of North Andover about recent housing developments and what the approval process looks like for housing developments. Uh, and we'll end by opening up the forum for a Q&A session um, by our panelists here. So we'll, we'll welcome questions from the audience and we will answer them to the best of our ability. So uh, to ask a question at any time during the presentation, just type in the Q&A box. It should be on your screen right at the bottom, sort of towards the middle. Um, you may ask questions anonymously um, and we'll, we'll be able to see your questions and we can um, answer them accordingly. Just an FYI, the webinar is being recorded and we will be using the polling feature in Zoom. And I gotta be totally honest, this is my first time using Zoom's polling feature, so I'm gonna, Fingers crossed it goes as smoothly as possible, but if it's a little clunky, uh, please forgive me. Um, so we'll be asking a couple polls through Zoom uh, and you can see um, the answers as folks answer it. So please, it's not mandatory, but uh, if you see a little question pop up, um, try to answer it. And so on that note, I'm gonna do our first poll, which is get to know the audience. So. Um, just a few questions about uh, age, who, how old are the folks who are in attendance? Um, and we'll be asking some other questions like, do you own a home in North Andover? Are you a renter here? How long have you been in the community? And out of curiosity, can folks see those answers coming in live? So, all right, so I get to, I get to get a sneak peek here at the, at the, the polling answers. I'm just gonna give this a couple more seconds. All right. And I'm gonna share the results. So those are the results of who's here tonight. We see a, a, a nice spread. Uh, the 50 to 60 age category wins for tonight with 33% of our attendees. And so the next question. I'm gonna allow the panelists to vote in this too. Um, we know that there's a, a couple of really good ice cream places in North Andover and out of curiosity, we wanted to know what the crowd favorites were. If there was a clear winner here, if you were ambivalent, if you liked both. Ooh, 
This is close. Cow's Rock, Mad Maggie's. Depends on the weather. I will share those out. Mad Maggie's taking the lead with 48% of the vote. We got a lot of depending on the weather. So uh, uh, they can go either way there. Poll number three. Affiliation with North Andover. Are you uh, here because you work for the town? A uh, member of a town committee, business owner, uh, general public, a uh, resident, other? Share the results. So 64% uh, members of the public. I'm sorry, I've got a huge spider on my desk, of course, and I'm trying to get him off because it's going to bother me for the whole presentation. Okay, I think he has moved away. Stop sharing results. All right. Rent, own, both rent and own, neither. So we got mostly owners in the, in the meeting today. We are in our last one, which is how long have you lived in North Andover? You new resident, uh, relatively new resident. You've been here since you were born. Do you not live here at all? That one, everyone answered very quickly. So we got a lot of 20 plus years in the, in the audience tonight. So a lot of long time North Andover residents, which is, which is awesome. Cool, cool. Well, that's just like a flavor. We wanted to get a flavor of, of the polling format and collect this information to see who, who shows up and who's, a, who's, a mem who's uh, you know, participating in the forum. And this is, this is really helpful information. We'll be asking a couple more polls throughout the um, presentation. Um, but this was, this was great. Thank you to everyone who answered. And we're going to move on. We're going to start with a couple stories from North Andover. You know, when we were thinking about this event, um, I'm, I'm a planner, so I'm very data oriented. I work with data all day long. Um, but uh, data doesn't always tell uh, a story. Data can be very boring. So um, to be perfectly frank. So we invited uh, residents of North Andover to come and kind of voice their mm -hmm. story, to put, a, to put a face, to put a human face to kind of all of the, um, uh, the housing issue in, in North Andover. So with that, um, <laughs> I will introduce Ian Burns. Ian. Thanks, Nate. So as, as Nate mentioned, my name is Ian Burns. I actually work with Nate at the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. I also grew up in North Andover. I graduated from a high school in 2014. I've lived here pretty much my whole life besides going away to college. Um, after college, I moved back home, moved in with my parents uh, during grad school, and I now have a full-time job while still living with my parents and paying off student loans. As much as I'd like to find a place of my own, the average cost of rent combined with a monthly student loan payment makes this nearly infeasible. I'm someone that I think is kind of caught in the middle when looking for housing, which I think applies to a lot of young professionals such as myself. Um, I make a bit too much to qualify for affordable, unit, affordable units, but I don't really make enough to find a good one bedroom apartment to qualify um, for a market rate that I can afford. Um, I love this town. Like I said, I grew up here and I like being here, but I'm not able to find a place to live here. And uh, the irony is not lost on me that in my professional job with the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, I work to make our region and our town more attractive and livable 
And yet I myself have trouble uh, living here if I were to move out of my parents' house. Uh, landlords and building owners uh, can charge high amounts for rent because demand is so high in this region and there's a, a lack of competition in the market. But if more housing options were available, perhaps the market rate for apartments would stabilize a bit more instead of increasing so much year to year. Uh, something else uh, from my perspective as a young person especially is that you know cities and towns really need a diversity of ages in order to, to be um, successful and stay relevant and vibrant. And young people really can help bring that energy and vibrancy to communities. Yet in North Andover, young professionals can't, find, uh, can't easily find a place to live. This kind of creates this interesting snowball effect because young, young people really like to live around other young people. They like to bring the energy to the community, but they can't afford to live here, which means there's less young people here, which means less young people are attracted to the area. Um, so this kind of positive feedback loop prevents more young people from moving into North Andover and eventually starting their families here. As I look to my future, I hope that one day I will be able to afford a house, but as of right now, being able to save up enough money for a down payment seems out of reach. Um, hopefully someday we'll be able to do that. And hopefully as a community, we can work to become more accessible for young people like myself. Thanks, Ian, I appreciate that. And um, we had a second speaker here, uh, Jim Dietz, the uh, owner of The Loft and Joe Fish. Uh, many of you may know him, but uh, part of being a restaurant owner means you are spread thin. And so unfortunately he, he, he's not here tonight, but um, uh, I'm gonna move this along and appreciate Ian, uh, your, your story. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew Shapiro, the Director of Community and Economic Development for the Town of North Andover and Christine Medor, the Senior Development Manager at Mass Housing Partnership. And they're gonna be going over a couple of housing frequently asked questions, things that they hear all the time uh, in regards to housing. And I give it over to you two. Thank you, Nate. Good evening, everybody. My name is Christine Medor. I'm a Senior Development Manager at Massachusetts Housing Partnership. MHP is a nonprofit agency that helps expand affordable housing opportunities through technical assistance, financing, and home ownership. And I'll quickly turn it over to Andrew to introduce himself. Thanks, Christine. Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Shapiro. I am the Town of North Andover's Director of Community and Economic Development. Uh, the division I oversee includes the Planning Department, Zoning Board of Appeals, Building Department, and Conservation Department, all of which are areas of town governance that are key to the development of new housing. So with that, I will just go ahead and pass it back to Christine. Thank you, Andrew. And everyone, again, I'm so glad that you have committed this time tonight to learn more about housing conditions in your town, and I'm sure that you have many questions. I'll be spending the next 10 minutes or so going through some frequently asked questions around housing development that you may have heard among your neighbors and friends. And Andrew will be helping me fill in some details along the way. And with that, next slide. First question, North Andover has enough people. Doesn't new housing just bring in more people from places like Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville? A growing population has economic benefits, including a greater tax base, more support for local businesses, a larger employment base for local employers, and it can also increase vibrancy and diversity in North Andover, as Ian had mentioned earlier. But the town's housing stock isn't meeting the needs of its current residents. There is a significant mismatch between the size of North Andover's housing inventory and household sizes. About half of North Andover's households consist of one to two people, but only a tenth of housing units are studio or one bedroom units. Smaller households are primarily seniors living alone, and there's close to about 1,500 uh, seniors living alone in town or single mothers with children. North Andover, like many communities in the region and the state, will see a growing population of retirees and empty nesters who will be looking to downsize from the larger homes that they raised their families in. Currently, the vast majority of North Andover's housing stock are homes with three or more bedrooms. That's about 63%, which means many seniors will have to leave the community to seek housing options that meet their needs or remain overhoused despite being on fixed incomes. The lack of smaller housing options also mean that lower wage earners in North Andover or those who cook your food, pour your coffee, teach your children in North Andover schools 
are not able to afford to live in town. Next slide. The next question that we hear a lot, are new units all luxury units that North Andover residents cannot even afford? It is true that many of the new homes being built in North Andover are market rate. Some of these new homes offer more affordable rents for those of middle and lower incomes than others, but increasing housing supply of all housing types at a range of price points will ease the competition driven by high demand for housing with limited supply. North Andover residents have the ability to change this. You can change your destiny. The town can consider changes to its zoning bylaw that will allow it to diversify its housing stock and provide more units that are affordable to people and families with different income levels. A first example of a potential bylaw change include allowing accessory dwelling units, which are small apartments that can be built onto an existing property, ideal as rentals for young professionals or as in-law suites for aging family members. ADUs have been widely used across the country as an effective way to create naturally affordable housing, ones that do not need heavy government subsidies to build. I'm confident many of us have lived in an ADU while we were in college or as a young professional. I know I did. In fact, many millennials today have moved back into their parents' homes to live in their base, basement or attic apartments because of rising housing costs. ADUs provide an opportunity for aging homeowners to stay in their homes with an additional revenue stream, which is why the AARP has been promoting this type of housing for many, many years. Another policy the town can adopt is inclusionary zoning, which requires developments over a certain size provide a percentage of units that are deed restricted affordable housing that are accessible to households of certain income levels. Both of these policy proposals, the ADU and inclusionary zoning bylaws, were recommendations from North Andover's recently adopted housing production plan, which Nate will talk about later on in the evening. The town is well positioned to make the next move on either proposals. Next question. Is North Andover's public schools capacity being exacerbated by school children living in new housing units being built in North Andover? New housing doesn't always mean more students. Over the past 10 years, about 678 new homes have come online in North Andover. 67% of these were multifamily, 30% were single family, and during the same period, school enrollment has remained steady, and in fact, dipping slightly in the last two years. A 2017 study by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council looked at housing permit and enrollment trends across 234 public school districts over six years from 2010 to 2016 and found no correlation between housing production rates and enrollment growth. While it is true that school children occupying new housing units may cause a marginal change in enrollment, they are one small factor among the many. In cities and towns with the most rapid housing production, enrollment barely budged, and most districts with the, large, with the largest student increases saw very little housing unit change. The rate of housing unit growth is not a useful predictor of overall school enrollment change, nor is rapid housing development a precondition to sudden enrollment increases. It appears that broad demographic trends, parental preferences, and housing availability now play a mar much larger role in enrollment growth and decline. Andrew? Thanks, Christine. I'm just gonna add a comment here. Um, the town recently completed a district-wide school capacity study that also takes into consideration uh, newly permitted developments and the proposed redevelopment of the Royal Crest Estates property, which I'm sure a lot on this, many on this call are aware of. The report and others linked to it can be found on the town's website about the Royal Crest development. Uh, which is linked to from the town's homepage. And uh, people can feel free to also reach out to me if they want to get access to that information. I'm happy to pass it along. The School Capacity Subcommittee has also been actively engaged on this issue and held three public forums in May to answer questions and solicit input from residents about renovations and possible additions to the Atkinson, Franklin, and Kittredge schools, as well as North Andover Middle School. 
as part of the town's facilities master plan phase two. So that's just a little extra information on sort of the work that's been done recently with respect to examining school capacity um, in the context of uh, building a new housing units. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. And the final question that we'd like to answer for you tonight is that the town should focus more on creating jobs, not housing. Next slide. The answer is that housing production is part of economic development. Housing, housing development has a net positive economic impact that is most evidently seen in North Andover's latest tax rolls, as you can see on the screen. Three of the top 10 tax revenue generators are multifamily residential developments. These are the AIMCO properties, which is also the Royal Crest property, Osgood, which is Princeton North Andover, and the Holdings property is Berry Farms. The town continually advances initiatives to support economic development. For instance, it supported the ongoing redevelopment of the Osgood Landing property that will host a new 3.8 million square foot Amazon distribution facility. The facility will employ at least 1,500 workers and provide an estimated $85 million in net new revenue to the town over the next 20 years. It's vital that the town ensures that there is a diverse housing stock available to existing and future employees of local companies. Without housing that's affordable to employees, employers may need to relocate to areas with more housing opportunity. Also, importing workers from other communities means bringing more traffic congestion to North Andover. Andrew? Thanks, Christine. Just add another comment uh, on this as well. Uh, in addition to the focus on large scale economic development, the town has definitely placed a high priority on ensuring the health of its small business community as well. Uh, during the pandemic, the town issued nearly $500,000 in direct aid to small businesses through grants. And again, I want to emphasize that's through the town not through state or federal funds. Um, that is in addition to distribution of free PPE and access to technical assistance for small businesses. So it's vital that there is housing stock available uh, in North Andover for people who work for these small businesses in addition to the larger employers, such as the incoming Amazon facility. And with that are all the frequently asked questions. I'll turn it back over to Nate. Thanks, Christine, and thanks, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to introduce uh, Jessica Harris, um, current resident in actually the Royal Crest Apartments and, and uh, North Andover resident to, to tell her story. Um, Jessica, whenever you're ready. You're, you're muted, Jessica. Sorry about go. that. Oh, good. Um, so I've been <clears throat> here in North Andover for just over a decade and um, housing has been probably my biggest struggle since I've been here. Um, I have worked as a art teacher and as a substitute teacher in both North Andover and in Andover and paying for the cost of rent has just become too much. So ultimately I have had to decide to leave the town because I can't afford to live here. And as you know, extended out, I'm actually leaving the state altogether because of the same reason. Um, the rent here has just never been something that I could feasibly afford. Um, I've been on housing lists for over a decade and have my name has not moved up. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty much my story is that I've been a, a good, hardworking resident here for a decade, a member of ch local church and part of the community, but I have to leave because I just, I can't afford it. That's pretty much it. Thanks, Jessica. And uh, I appreciate your story. Um, I did want to remind folks really quickly that you can, um, Folks have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A function, should be at the bottom of your screen at any time. Um, and we can have the panelists here sort of answer them as, as they come in, um, just a reminder. So I just wanna jump in here 
and talk a little bit about um, the housing production plan. Uh, over the course of the last five years, a lot of long-term planning has taken place to provide North Andover with a blueprint for moving forward. In 2018, the town approved a new master plan, which takes a comprehensive look at the town and recommended land use and zoning changes in accordance to the publicly shared vision for the future. Some of those recommendations were based on the 2017 North Andover Housing Production Plan, which took a comprehensive look specifically at housing in the town. Uh, this was, uh, a, the production plan was a, a project that uh, MVPC did. We, we uh, helped produce the town. Uh, pro <laughs> we helped produce the document for the town. We uh, helped produce actually housing production plans for all 15 communities in our region, in the Merrimack Valley region, as well as a overarching regional housing production plan. Um, and we created a three-tiered process to develop the housing plans, uh, public engagement, vision alignment, which means taking a look at other strategic plans like, uh, like a master plan and information gathering. MVPC worked with the town to facilitate in-person and virtual opportunities to engage North Andover residents. So this is very much a publicly driven exercise. The in-person opportunities included two workshops. The first was held in June of 2017 to understand local housing needs. And the second workshop was held in November, 2017 and it identified potential housing locations and strategies to meet those housing needs. Virtual opportunities consisted of social media posts uh, and the use of the web-based tool Co-Urbanize, um, which was, uh, we used it to, to help folks get engaged who may not be able to meet public meetings because we know that not everybody has the time or the bandwidth to, uh, to go to public meetings. The process resulted in a 73 page document titled the North Andover Housing Production Plan. And it consisted of an analysis of demographic and housing trends and a number of key recommendations based on the feedback uh, and the vision we got from uh, the public along the way. The Housing Production Plan was approved by a unanimous vote by the North Andover Planning Board in May of 2018. And it was also uh, approved by a unanimous vote of the Board of Selectmen in June of 2018. And there were a number of key findings articulated in the housing production plan. And I would definitely encourage everybody in the audience today to, to go out and read the full report. Uh, if you really wanna get into the weeds, there is a ton, there's, uh, there's over 70 pages of data you can comb through. Um, but for the sake of time, I'll just highlight a few of the findings which um, were particularly important. Additionally, I kind of went through it uh, while we were making this presentation and updated the numbers. So these are, uh, uh, using the most recent data we could because you know some things have changed since 2017. So looking at the updated numbers, we find that North Andover is growing in line with the rest of the Merrimack Valley. The population has grown by 12% since 2011 uh, compared to the region's 8% total growth. This is good. Growing communities are healthy communities and North Andover's growth has been steady and consistent. Population growth, how, however, is only like a real high level look and doesn't tell you much about the housing needs of a community. So for that, we'll have to go a little bit deeper. And Christine did a, a wonderful job at illustrating this point. Um, we've seen that household growth has been consistent with population growth, meaning that the average household size has not necessarily grown or, or shrunk. The 2019 American Community Survey shows us that 54% of North Andover households are one to two people in size. So that's a household consisting of one person or consisting of two people. Yet only 11% of the town's housing stock are studios or one bedrooms. I've been in this position as a young person looking for a place myself to live. I think a lot of young people have or single household people it is a nightmare to find uh, a one bedroom place or a studio apartment. And it's because they only make up for 11% of the town's housing stock. 63% of the town's housing stock consists of properties with three or more bedrooms. So this shows the mismatch, the, that the housing stock does not match up with the household size. Understanding the age breakdown of the population allows us to understand where future housing needs might be. It also gives us a better understanding of household makeup. The housing production plan looked at an estimated projections for populations 
uh, and found that the 65 and older community was on track to double in size from 12% of the population to 25% of the population. That's a little bit more than double in size. This is a regional and statewide trend. So this isn't unique to North Andover. And this is a result of the baby boomer generation getting older and older. But what this does is it creates a huge need for age-friendly housing, especially as older folks continue to downsize, moving out of large three to four bedroom homes, moving into smaller homes. We've seen in the, in the housing characteristics graph that there's very limited supply of studio and single bedroom homes, products that are already in high demand by young professionals. If North Andover hopes to accommodate both young professionals and its elderly, it needs to increase the supply of one to two bedroom homes. We can look at this extraordinary demand for housing simply by looking at North Andover's vacancy rates. This is updated with 2019 numbers and we see ownership and rental vacancy at 2.7 and 3.5% respectively. According to the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, a 7% vacancy rate is considered a sign of a healthy market. You want a, a certain level of vacancy. Given the low vacancy rates and potential continued growth of population and households in the coming years, North Andover's housing needs may be best addressed through a combination of conversions of existing housing stock from market rate to affordable, new housing production of both market rate and affordable, as well as direct support for homeowners and renters who are struggling with housing costs. When we take a look at who is renting, we see some clear trends emerge. The two largest categories of renters are people under the age of 35 and people over the age of 75. If you take a look at that graph, the 75 and older crowd makes up 20.5% of renters and the 35 and younger crowd takes up 31.6% of renters. And it illustrates the point made earlier that young professionals and elderly longtime residents of North Andover are competing for limited rental units. Compared to 2015 numbers, it looks like Ando North Andover has increased its share of young people renting, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And compared to the region, but compared to the region this, uh, and the state, North Andover has significantly more renters that are over the age of 75 years. This is almost double what we see regionally in other communities. So this shows us that North Andover already has a comparatively large elderly rental population and a population which, as we saw earlier, is on track to double in the coming years. One of the findings um, that was particularly uh, glaring was that North Andover has a significant affordability gap. So this is a, a, a term used by housing planners in particular. An affordability gap is a way to measure housing ownership affordability by looking at the median household income of a community and measuring that against the median sales price of a home. How much do people make versus how much do homes cost? And to, to, to determine how much a household can afford, they multiply the annual income by 3.88, which is a metric used in the housing production plans to roughly calculate uh, affordability. This uh, calculation essentially shows you how much house you can buy with the salary that you're getting. Um, the housing production plan showed that North Andover had a significant affordability gap in 2016. In fact, it was the second highest in the region. In the following slides, I'll show you how that gap has changed using uh, more recent data. So we can see based on MLS that the 2019 median sales price of a single family home was $622,000 in North Andover. This means that a household would have to make around $160,000 a year which um, to afford that price. Um, so that's the $160,000 is uh, that number is represented in blue showing a portion of the median single family home price. So what was the 2019 median household income? The 2019 household median income, however, was $108,000, which gives households the ability to afford a around a $419,000 home, a far, uh, far cry from the median $622,000 median sales price, which we see in North Andover. The difference, the difference between those two numbers is called the affordability gap, which as of 2019 sits at $203,000. And we adjust for inflation, this represents a 56% increase since 2016. 
This growing and stark affordability gap illustrates that single family home ownership opportunities are increasingly out of reach for working people. When we created the North Andover Housing Production Plan, we asked people what they valued. What do they wanna see in the town? This is also an exercise that was done during the, the master plan. So here are some of the values that, the, that were crowdsourced during the creation of the housing production plan. And the actions were, recommend, were recommendations um, to help move the town in a direction that supported these values. So in the next few slides, we'll go over what those recommendations were. Um, and I'll ask folks to rank them based on uh, current importance. And some of those values were folks wanted to see a town that attracts young people. People wanted to see a town that had a variety of housing options, a mixture of housing prices, a place with social, economic, and racial diversity, a place with young children, a place where older folks can age without having to leave, housing options close to services and shops, housing options close to transit, and a place with well-funded public schools. So here's, I'm gonna go back to the polls here and ask the crowd, let's see here. Launch polling. Do you think that homeowners uh, in North Andover should be able to create small accessory dwelling units? And this was uh, the topic that Christine had covered so so aptly. And we're getting some results in. About half of you have voted. Seventy percent of you have voted. Can we get to eighty percent? Oh, we're slowing down at seventy-six. All right, let me share these out. So uh, a majority of you in here strongly agree with that idea uh, and a vast majority agree either strongly or just regularly agree. And Do you think that the town should pass an, an inclusionary zoning bylaw. And like Christine had mentioned earlier, this mandates that developments above a certain size have to have an affordable housing component. So the little infograph to the right shows you exactly what that means. And let me just share the poll. Got 40% in. 50% and this polling feature is pretty cool. I'm enjoying this. 73%, can we be, less? we're back at 76%. That seems to be the magic number right now. So I'm gonna, 80%, all right, there we go. 77%, we've gone down, somebody has unvoted. All right, I'm gonna share these results. So again, this seems to be pretty popular, at least with the, the crowd we have here today. And I've got one more question for you. Do you think that North Andover should encourage the production of a diversity of housing types? So whether it's ADUs, um, skinny houses, so houses with lower footprints, uh, cottage clusters, triplexes, fourplexes, ADU detached, duplexes, and let me pull up the next poll. This is uh, following the first two. Seems like there's a fair level. And this is our highest, we got 80%, all right. Share the results. So folks can see that there tends to be, at least in, in the audience today, a, a, a overwhelming support um, for uh, diversity of housing. So I'd like to introduce Jean Enright, the North Andover Planning Director, to talk a little bit about how new housing projects are approved and talk a little bit about the new housing projects that have happened recently uh, in the town. And Jean, to you. All right, thank you, Nate. As Nate indicated, I am the planning director for the town of North Andover. Um, Nate, if you could flip 
the slide. So I think it's time for a little bit of comic relief here. Housing development, as simple as putting toothpaste on a toothbrush. Actually, housing development is fairly difficult anywhere, and North Andover is no exception. Whether a use is allowed by right or by special permit, developments of size require a site plan review of special permit for which the planning board is the special permit granting authority. So if we spend a couple of minutes on this slide here, kind of walk you through the development process. So typically we'll, we'll receive a proposal for development and tonight we're really focusing on a lot of the multifamily developments that have occurred over the last few years. And so when, it, when an application comes forward, the developers usually will sit down and meet with us. And if the project does not meet all the zoning requirements that are in our zoning bylaw, pretty much it can't go forward as proposed. Oftentimes, the proposal will require a zoning bylaw amendment. Zoning bylaw amendments require a town meeting action. And so if it requires a zoning bylaw amendment, again, it can't go forward as proposed. It can go forward as a warrant article, either sponsored by the planning board or sponsored as a citizen petition on occasion. Town meeting has that vote and to date, zoning amendment, um, zoning bylaw amendments have required a two thirds vote. And so should town meeting not approve that zoning bylaw amendment, then the developer could not go forward in the permitting process at that point. If town meeting were to approve the zoning amendment bylaw, the proposal could go forward. And that means typically a permitting process that could require multiple boards and commissions um, required to review the application and approve the project. And so that approval process often includes special permits. Site plan review is one of which of those special permits, but often they require multiple special permits. A project can require multiple boards, as I said, often including the planning board, the conservation commission, and the Zoning Board of Appeals, as well as we have historic districts. And so one of the projects we're gonna talk about later required machine shop village neighborhood conservation district approval as well. Now through the site plan review process, the planning board often requires and focuses on a stormwater management plan, department review, which means that application is sent to multiple departments across the town to, to receive comments, um, oftentimes, suggested conditions if approval were to be given. There's also a traffic input study required, fiscal and community impact analysis, and other elements that are required in the application process. Should that project be approved by these various boards and commissions, the project can move forward through to building permit application process. Each of these boards and commissions do, however, have an appeal process. And so if it were to be appealed, that could stall a project. However, the vast majority do move forward to building permit process at that point. Now, as I said, focusing on site plan review, the planning board is the permit granting authority for that. One purpose of site plan review is to protect the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town by providing for a review of plans for uses and structures which may have significant impacts both within the site and in relation to adjacent properties and streets. Now that's specified in the zoning bylaw. That is the responsibility of the planning board to ensure through the review process. This review considers the impact on public services and infrastructure, environmental, unique and historic resources, abutting pro properties, and community character and ambience. In addition to the plans and elevations, site plan review applications requires the stormwater management plan, traffic impact study, fiscal and community impact analysis, and various other elements. The planning board hires consultants, which are paid by the applicant, to peer review the stormwater management plan and the civil designs. For large scale developments, the board also often requires peer review for traffic and water and sewer design. The Avalon Bay project, will, which we'll review in a minute, also included a peer review for the fiscal impact analysis. And as I stated earlier, the approval process also includes review and comments submitted by town staff, including but not limited to the police department, the fire department, Department of Public Works, health, conservation, building, and the school department. So let's look at a couple of the specific housing developments that occurred in the recent past. 
So in this example, um, which if you, the Princeton Properties Development, which was recently constructed on Osgoode Street, did require a zoning bylaw amendment and town meeting approval, which was approved by two thirds vote. The project required a few special permits as well as site plan review. The project required approval by both the planning board and the conservation commission. And as I stated, the review included everything in the box from stormwater management, department review, traffic, fiscal, and then was able to proceed to a building permit process. The next development that we'll review is often referred to as Minco. It's the former Knights of Columbus on Sutton Street. Again, the project did not meet the zoning requirements, required a zoning bylaw amendment to be approved by town meeting, which was by two thirds vote. This project, in addition to planning board and conservation, also required zoning board of appeals approval and ultimately was able to move forward to a building permit process um, after again an appeal process which most boards have varying times for that appeal, appeal project but it did make it through each of these boards and the third development we'll review is the what's referred to as rcg slash avalon bay development which is located on high street this project um, came subsequent to a zoning bylaw amendment so the the, the rcg development team actually was laying out a master plan to build out the mills, both the east and west side, and that master plan required zoning bylaw amendment, which created the subdistrict A historic mill area. So the bylaw amendment did pass by town meeting, again by two thirds, and this approval actually laid in another review. So in addition to planning board, conservation, the zoning board of appeals, machine shop village district also was included. Um, in this review process. And again, all the same elements are reviewed and the project was allowed to move forward towards building permit process. So where are these um, multifamily housing developments going? And here you'll see a map, I apologize, it's a little hard to read the box in the lower right-hand corner. But what this map is identifying is that the recent housing projects have been located along priority zones for development and along major corridors. So the dark outline on the map you'll see is both Route 125 and 114 where these projects have been located. The bottom left-hand corner of the map provides an index for somewhat recent developments, the number of units for each, whether they were permitted through the 40B process and the status of the project. So we can scroll through from north to south to kind of review the locations here. I'm sorry, if you go back to the first, yeah, so so here we're in the northern part. Um, this dark blue area is indexing a priority development zone. So number six on the index is the Princeton Property Development on Osgoode Street, which we referred to earlier. Number nine is the Minco, former Knights of Columbus, again on the corner of Sutton Street and Route 125. Number one is the Avalon Bay project, which was actually referenced in the housing production plan that Nate reviewed earlier as a kind of priority location for a multifamily housing development. So if you can scroll one more time, Nate. Okay, as we continue to move south, um, number eight, I apologize, I actually have to look at that. Oh, eight, I'm sorry, is Stevens Crossing, which is the corner of Park Street and Osgood Street. So it's just off of Route 125. Index number four is Kittredge Crossing, again, located directly on Route 125. Number 10 is Compass Point, a 40B project located on Route 114. Let's go to the last, last slide, Nate. Okay, and then those are followed by Berry Farms. I'm sorry, I think I think I misstated that. So the the previous one was the Royal Crest development, which as you know, um, Andrew referred to either earlier is proposed as a redevelopment project. I apologize for that. So that's index 10. Then we have Berry Farms is number two, Compass Point is number three. And 
um, Oak Ridge Village, I apologize. So number five is Oak Ridge Village, which is located directly on 114 on the North Andrew Middleton line. Um, and again, more information is located in that bottom index in terms of the number of units and the status of those developments. So some have been permitted, some have been constructed, and some of them are currently proposed and not approved yet. That would be the Rural Crest project. So Nate, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jane, appreciate it. And uh, um, it always boggles my mind to think about <laughs> housing development pipelines. Uh, they never look, uh, they, they're never simple, but I think you illustrated it uh, in a way that, that makes it relatively understandable. So um, I want to turn it over uh, and introduce folks to, to, to Max and Deanna, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. But uh, I'm going to have Max, I'm going to kick it to you and have you go first. And Deanna, if you wouldn't mind closing us out. Um, and we, looks like on time, we are doing really well on time. So if you've got uh, some extra thoughts, um, they're welcome. <laughs> and Max, I'll kick it to you. Hey, can you yep. hear me okay? Yep. Hi, so my name is Max. I'm uh, 25 years old. I've lived in town since I was four and I've been attending school in Boston for the last seven years. Uh, I actually just graduated law school over the weekend. And similar to Ian, I live at home with my parents, actually in my parents' basement, which I'm sure they're thrilled about. And I've been looking to rent or buy my own place uh, with little success, similar to Ian. And um, I've been working at a real estate law firm in Andover for the past two years, where I see firsthand the high prices in, in the market. And I'm constantly reminded how far the goal of home ownership is for people like me. And also in March, I was uh, recently elected to the town's North Andover Housing Authority Board, which manages the town's uh, affordable housing units. Do you want to introduce Diana too, or do you want to keep going? Um. Yeah, if you've got some more to say, I think we've oh, got some we've yeah. got a little bit extra time. Yeah, feel yeah, free. Like, as, a, as a 25 year old citizen in town, uh, I, you know, I wanted to be, I want there to be housing that's available to people like me. You know, I, I grew up in town. I participated in all the great things our town has to offer, you know, sports, town activities like the sheep shearing festival, 4th of July, public schools, uh, everyone's favorite town meeting. And uh, most of my friends are actually still here in town. And um, I went away to college and law school and and now I'm looking for a place to live. And I, I wanna live and work in the community that I've called home my entire life. But the situation is that housing is just too expensive in our town for young professionals and recent graduates like myself to afford. It's really great that we have such an amazing town that wants so many people that they, you know, they wanna live and share with us. However, this high demand and, and lack of affordable supply has caused the prices to become unaffordable to young people like me as we've seen the presentations tonight. And um, we currently have to live with our parents. And honestly, I don't know anyone my age who owns a home in the area. We all have to either rent far away or, or live with our parents. And my friends and I were all at the beginning or, or, or early stages of our careers. And we have large amounts of student debt and we have to live with our parents or the faraway apartments. And we want to come home. We want, we want to live and work here, but it's, it's nearly impossible. Like, how are we supposed to pay off our student loans, pay our rent, our living expenses, and also save money to put that down payment down a house? It's a really tough balance to, to find. And we all did. We went to college, we got jobs, we worked hard, but now we can't afford to live in the town we grew up in. And, you know, I'm, I'm a fully employed law school graduate that can't afford to get my own place in, in the town I grew up in. And we want to join this community we grew up in. And, and we understand that home ownership is the best way to build wealth and establish ourselves and our, our future families in the community. And it's really disappointing to me that, that young people that were raised here can't afford to start their adult lives here. Thanks, Max. And uh, Deanna? Thank you. Um, Nate, you made a mistake with my introduction there on the screen. I am an aspiring North Andover resident. <laughs> my mistake, Deanna. <laughs> um, so my name is Deanna Lima. I am the coordinator for the town. Um, and my role with the town is to um, provide crisis stabilization services for residents um, and a lot of that is around um, behavioral health issues, but also uh, social service issues. So a lot of folks um, come to me and are referred to me um, because of housing issues. And um, uh, a lot of the, the folks that come to me uh, would probably surprise the general public um, in terms of their demographic. 
the majority of folks that struggle with maintaining their housing in North Andover are uh, seniors, so folks in, in late adulthood. And um, very often it's people that uh, cannot maintain their um, single family homes and uh, they've lived in town for a long time, um, all their lives probably, and their homes are in disrepair or, you know, there are a lot of different situations, um, but they have come to a point where they can no longer afford to stay in their home. Um, that also happens quite a bit with uh, families with children in school. And I get a lot of my referrals from the school system as well. So quite a few of um, the, the families that struggle with housing that I support are families where there are two uh, parents or two adults in the family who have a full-time income coming in and um, they struggle to make ends meet, um, whether it's a home they own or a home they rent. And the most troubling thing is that folks come to me, and, and this was um, very much an issue during the pandemic, folks come to me and are referred to me in the hope that there is a safety net um, or expecting that there's a safety net in society for people experiencing a crisis of this level. You think that when you're experiencing a housing crisis and facing um, homelessness or the potential for homelessness, that there is some agency or some institution or, or something that will support you and, and save you from becoming homeless. And there just isn't. There are various programs, um, but they're not all well-funded um, and, and they all have limitations. And at the end of the day, what happens is I have to refer people to shelters, homeless shelters. Um, and I've had to um, refer families and elderly people to homeless shelters um, because of this. So it, it is an awful situation. Um, there, there certainly are many struggles when it comes to housing. People are very shocked um, to find out the, the level of need that there is in North Andover, not just around housing issues, but um, in many other ways. A lot of folks come to me for, and I refer to me for support, because all of their resources go into maintaining their housing. Um, and that leaves them with fewer resources for basic necessities like food. Um, and, and that was very much an issue um, during the pandemic as well. And um, another issue that I see a lot as it relates to housing uh, are families that um, multi-generations live in one home. So you have the original homeowner, their children, their grandchildren. Um, so lots of families living together, lots of households living together to make ends meet. And, you know, in many ways, this is helpful, um, not just from the financial aspect, um, but in the social emotional aspect, there's a lot of benefits from that. But um, sometimes there are a lot of drawbacks as well. Uh, to that. And it's it's not always uh, something that folks choose and it's not always ideal. So that's another struggle. And um, I, I had a comment on the um, the misprint that, that I'm a North Andover resident because ironically, I've been trying to become a North Andover resident um, since taking this position with the town. Um, it's coming upon three years since this position was created um, and, and I happily accepted it. And uh, I live in, in Southern New Hampshire and um, have moved uh, three times in, in the time that I've worked for the town and each time have looked for housing in North Andover and have been unable to um, find housing that um, meets my needs. And, and one of the, the biggest factors in meeting my needs is um, the cost of housing. And I'm kind of on, in, in a completely different um, category uh, than, than Max just explained. Um, I'm later in my career 
midlife, um, empty nester, my kids are gone. So it's just me. I have no interest in owning a house anymore. I just want to rent a unit. I don't want any responsibility. Um, I want to be in North Andover because my job requires me to respond to crises uh, during off hours. So I often find myself traveling back to town at night and on weekends. But everything I've looked at has been um, just priced astronomically compared to what I pay in Southern New Hampshire. So um, I find it, it really unfortunate that um, I haven't been able to find something and, and I have the most privileged of situations in terms of um, advantages in finding housing. So I can certainly, um, I, I can certainly sympathize with um, all my uh, fellow panelists who are struggling to find housing. So there are many, many challenges um, other than the obvious challenges and I, I see a lot of them and, and people don't like to share these challenges naturally because um, it's, it's difficult private information. Um, and if anybody that is listening um, or watching um, is struggling, please reach out to me. Um, and I'm happy to, to help with the, the resources that are available. Or if you're struggling in any area, please feel free to reach out. And Nate, you made a mistake by saying, keep talking, because I could keep going and going. So I'm going to stop there. That's fine to keep talking. Honestly, you know, you provide such a, a unique insight, just being in the position you're being, helping folks, uh, North Andover residents navigate crises, and then being on the other side of it yourself as being somebody who wants to live in town and is facing those same sort of housing pressures yourself. So. Um, you certainly provide an invaluable perspective, um, and, and, and thank you for, for sharing it with us. Um, I wanted to thank all of our storytellers, really, for, for you know, getting a little vulnerable and telling their, their stories. These aren't always easy things to talk about, especially when it's impacting your life and something as essential as housing. Um, you know, this is uh, this sometimes can be st tough stuff to talk about. So I really appreciate um, every, all our storytellers here carving out some time and, and kind of sharing a, a little bit about that um, with us. And with that, um, I'm going to move into the question and answer uh, uh, portion of this webinar. Um, you know, I've got it slated to uh, 7.30. So we've got, you know, 25 minutes uh, for folks to sort of ask uh, questions to the panelists. You can direct it at one of us, you can direct it at all of us. Um, and we'll do our best to kind of, what I'll do is if I, some questions are coming in, I can kind of pose them to the panel and maybe we can, we can talk about them sort of, sort of like that. Um, and if there are specific questions, uh, we can maybe uh, uh, that come through, uh, we can sort of type some answers. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of bouncing back and forth, taking a look at questions that have already been answered. And, and thank you for folks who have already submitted things. And thank you to the panelists who have, who have answered some of them. Um, uh, are there other questions that folks would like to sort of throw out there that, that we can provide some insight on or answers to or context? Can I just um, uh, speak briefly to, um, there, there had been a question about Section 8 housing. Sure. Um, so Section 8 housing, um, Section 8 is a voucher program, um, as Andrew had responded to that question. Um, Section 8 is a, a voucher that a person receives to assist in paying their rent wherever they go. And there's often um, this, um, mis this false belief that certain units accept Section 8. By law, everybody is required to accept a Section 8 voucher. It is illegal to discriminate and say, I don't accept Section 8 if you're a, a landlord. So if you see a, an ad, ad for um, a unit that's for rent that says no Section 8 accepted, that person is breaking the law and discriminating. Hopefully they don't know that and some education would help them with that. Um, the, and, and when you have a, a Section 8 voucher, you can take it to anywhere in the state and rent an apartment. 
um, the challenge is uh, there, there's only so many vouchers available and they're distributed by different um, agencies and organizations in municipalities and uh, in the state at the state level. So it, um, they're not readily available and you can be on a wait list for over 10 years to get a section eight voucher. There's also public housing. So in North Andover, we have um, six uh, senior public housing um, groupings. Oh my gosh, I forget the word, but um, those facilities uh, also have a, a, at least a 10 year wait list if you don't have uh, special considerations to get into them sooner. Um, and, and the more special considerations you have, the quicker you might get in, uh, but the special considerations would be things like homelessness, veteran status, disability status, um, so things that would really be difficult. So again, you know, to my previous point, um, there are programs that, that help people with housing, but they're just not well-funded enough um, for the need and um, you can be waiting forever and, and never get that service. Right, right. And that's what we heard earlier uh, with, with Jessica's experience as somebody who's tried to navigate these programs and, you know, just it's, a, it's an ever growing list and it's always resource strapped. We had a question come in from Mark um, asking how far away from the 10% affordable housing threshold is North Andover? Both in terms of percentages and the number of housing units that uh, that represent. Um, and Andrew, I don't know if you have these numbers in front of you, but uh, uh, could you speak to how far away the the town is, at least percentage-wise? So percentage-wise, we are 1.3 percent away. Now, this is uh, so. Just to clarify, we have so we have 8.7 percent um, as certified by the Department of Housing and Community Development, the state's. Uh, overarching authority on that issue. Um, but the number on how many units we need to get to the 10% threshold is a little less clear. Uh, and it's because since that last certification, we have added several housing units and continue to add several housing units, most of which, as was described in one of those slides, um, are market rate. So they add to our total number of housing units within the town and kind of uh, kind of push the goal a little further back for us in order to get to that 10%. So um, let's just assume that, and, oh, and by the way, we're also on the verge of um, uh, getting in the data for the, from the new uh, 2010, or excuse me, 2020 census. Mm -hmm. uh, so that data will also play into the number of housing units that DHCD considers us to have. So um, I don't have a crystal clear answer for you. Gene and I have rattled around the number a, a lot. Uh, as folks are probably aware, you know, um, the, the Royal Crest Project is proposing a number of um, uh, what are called 40B uh, apartment units. And so that would add to our inventory or subsidize housing inventory and get us over that. The goal is to get over that 10% threshold. Um, Gene, I don't know, I don't know if I'll, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you have a even a ballpark number on the house, number of housing units we would need? Yeah, so my ballpark number without what's proposed at Rural Crest is 243 units. So the 950 that exists today plus 243 would bring us to 1,193 affordable units on the SHI listing, which would be 10%. That's rough back of the envelope numbers, adding in what has been recently constructed and permitted to be constructed. Um, but again, that does not include the rural press number. That's helpful. And and for those who are not aware, uh, there are 385 units of 40B housing being proposed for the rural crest project. So, given that 200, uh, that the high 200 figure, that would get us over the threshold most likely. Um, and just so folks also understand, uh, when you propose a rental housing project under the 40B um, statute, even though let's say only 25% of those units might be deemed capital A affordable uh, subsidized housing units, 
the total number of units within that development, meaning even the market rate units are counted towards the town's subsidized housing inventory. Um, so. And so just in, in layman's terms, that means that sometimes market rate units that don't have an affordable component get categorized or put in that 10% bucket. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I know. Um, are there other questions that uh, folks have about affordable housing, about multifamily housing in general, about uh, North Andover? Comments about your favorite ice cream place and why it might be better than the other. Um, Nate, I thought it might be helpful. There was a few questions about um, how much an affordable unit costs and what it takes to qualify for that affordable unit. So whether or not you have, you're at 80% of the area media income, 20%, 50%, whatever that is. So maybe um, if Christine or Andrew or someone could speak to that to clarify, because there's a couple questions about it and it might be helpful for folks to hear like, how much is an affordable one bedroom apartment if, if we have that data or where they can find that data? Right, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. I know that's not always an, an easy question to answer. Um, Christine, could you speak a little to it? Sure. And just as you said, Nate, housing data is a double-edged sword. You want to make sure people have the right facts, but the facts are also very complex and not easily digestible. So I will try my best to answer some of these uh, questions around rent generally. So the, the biggest misconception around affordable housing is what is actually affordable. And in the affordable housing field, we generally categorize affordable housing into two buckets. First, what we call the lowercase a affordable or naturally affordable housing. And the rents tend to be lower the market rate because of the size of the units or the conditions. So for example, a basement apartment tends to be smaller, have a smaller living space and different accommodations that a landlord cannot reasonably charge higher than market rate because nobody would rent it. So there are market forces at play there. And the other type of affordable housing that we talk about is what we call the capital A affordable housing, which is created by heavy government subsidies and this includes um, Section 8 rentals and different types of federal and state government subsidies that uh, would go into creating these units that are re deed restricted to households or people making a certain level of income. And this includes the 40B units. And so to quali qualify for those capital A affordable housing units, you would have to make a certain level of income. Uh, and as Ian had uh, alluded to earlier, a lot of people make just a little too much to qualify or not enough, or you know, there's a lot of gaps uh, on whether you could qualify for a capital A affordable rental unit. And for those units, the rents are set by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. They're called a fair market rent. So these subsidized affordable units can only charge a certain level of rent as determined by HUD. And you can find the fair market rents by easily Googling fair market rent Massachusetts. And it gives you a quick form to determine, just to, to help you look up the fair market rents for different uh, bedroom sizes. And in the Q&A, I had put in a quick example for 2021, a fair market rent for a studio apartment is $984. A one bedroom is $1,148. A two bedroom is $1,474. A three bed is $1,833. And a four bedroom is $1,999. These rents all include utilities. I hope that's helpful. You know, there's yeah, a lot just, of numbers and data. Yeah. I'll just quickly add, <laughs> thank you, Christine, that was great. And I'll just quickly add for the for folks who are curious about um, uh, 
you know, for sale units, because we're talking about rental units. There are also units that are often put on the market for sale uh, that are affordable. Um, I did post in the response to uh, the person asking about affordable housing, the rent of affordable housing, uh, an advertisement for um, a for sale unit in North Andover that's currently available as part of the Oak Ridge Village uh, Maplewood Reserve property. It's a townhouse. Um, it's at uh, it's a three bedroom, two and a half baths with one parking space, 2,264 200, yeah, 2,264 square feet for $233,500. And there's income uh, restrictions uh, associated with that. So you would, if you were a one person, single person, you couldn't make uh, an annual income of over $70,750 per year. If you were a two person household, you couldn't make over $80,850 per year in income uh, in order to qualify to purchase that property. Um, and so these units will often uh, come on the market. Uh, the uh, CHAPA, for instance, is one of the um, affordable housing uh, monitoring agents in town that oversee a lot of these units, making sure that they, once they get put on the market for sale, they get transferred to someone else who uh, qualifies as income qualifying uh, to purchase the unit. So just another, just a little more information about sort of the, uh, what's available out there and what the price point is. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, one of the questions we had in was uh, any consideration for mobile housing units. And I know just while I was looking at the, the North Andover housing stats, it, I think there was zero uh, mobile housing units in the town. Is that right? Gene, you might know. Sorry. I, I, be I believe it's zero. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I believe it's zero. So. All right, I just didn't want to say and have it not be true, but yeah, it, it, this is there was zero in the ACS survey. Um, and, and so um, it doesn't look like there's any uh, that exist in town, um, but um, any considerations for mobile housing units? Is that something that anyone's ever proposed or any, uh, any developers coming in and doing? I, I have not been part of any proposals involving mobile housing. And to be honest, I. I don't know that our zoning allows for it. And just mm. because the topic hasn't come up, I haven't really investigated it, but that would, the building commissioner would have to weigh in on that. Okay. I guess going off of that, do any um, uh, mobile homes or any type of um, some of those tiny, tiny homes that are mobile that you see, would any of those ever qualify under an accessory dwelling unit bylaw that we might pass? Do we see towns doing that or is that strictly a structure in place? I've never personally seen it as part of an ADU bylaw, not to say that it can't be done, um, but no, I've, I've only seen it in the context of building a fixed structure, you know, on a property or attached to a property, existing property. Um, so, Nate, do you want me to take this one about the, the there was someone who, um, they posted this question about the uh, the Royal Crest development. I can give some context to the, the housing forum. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be great. All right, so the, this uh, attendee asks, or he says, uh, he or she says, I know this forum was put together because of the Royal Crest redevelopment proposal. Why is it so bad to improve what has become an old tired complex? Why do we fear mixed use, higher density plan that includes retail as well as housing all within walking distance of each other. And I just want to just state on the record, you know, I don't, you know, we worked with um, obviously with MHP and MVPC to put this together. They've been great partners. We appreciate it. I just want to be very clear. We did not put this together in response directly to the uh, Royal Crest proposal. I, I personally, as the director of community and economic development feel it's important to have these discussions at various junctures. I think, um, you know, one thing I'll note, uh, for those who don't know me, I've been working for the town for about a year and a half, a little longer than that now. And one of my main charges is to really ensure that we um, implement the strategies outlined in the master plan. And uh, there are a lot of strategies that speak to mixed use development, housing. Uh, and of course, Nate went over, um, you know, the information contained on our housing uh, uh our housing development, housing yep. production plan, thank you. And a lot of that information is pointed back to 
from our master plan to the housing production plan. And so I think uh, as a town, we just felt it was important to have these conversations, shed a little light on some of the larger issues with respect to housing. Um, we had a discussion, for instance, in this uh, today about uh, a potential ADU bylaw, a potential inclusionary zoning bylaw. Those are certainly uh, important elements to the overall discussion about housing. And so, yes, obviously, Royal Crest is a um, kind of a big splashy news event. Uh, and and uh, you know, I personally agree that it, it would be nice to see um, a strong mix uh, mix of uses in that area. Our our master plan certainly calls for it. But again, I just wanted to be clear that um, we didn't call this forum to uh, to respond directly to that. We wanted to be educational in a, in a very broad and high level sense about housing, so we could give some more context. Thanks, Andrew. And I think actually we've we've seen kind of the need for that in in a the public discourse that happens around housing uh, and the complexity uh, we see when we actually begin to kind of peel the onion layer back on housing issues. These aren't simple issues. They're really complex, whether it's affordable housing or mixed use or particular policies like inclusionary zoning or accessory dwelling units that that um, kind of continually doing education and continually inviting uh, the public to uh, participate in these conversations is beneficial, um, period. Um, and this is, I know from, from the planning commission's perspective, uh, this is work we, that we did in communities throughout the region and housing is not an issue that stops at municipal borders. Uh, housing is a, is a regional issue, it's a statewide issue. So this is something that we see as a model that we can then bring to other communities, continuing to do some education, continuing to bring a platform so folks can talk about issues with housing or their own experiences with housing so we can continue moving forward uh, in a way that uh, uh, that we all kind of uh, agree with in terms of uh, a, un a unified vision for what we want to see our towns um, to look like. Um, and I did have a question that I wanted to, to answer about uh, the priority uh, development areas. Uh, folks may have seen, looks like we've got that storm coming in now. Look at that. Um, uh, Folks may have seen on the map uh, those big blue areas, and actually, maybe I'll just move back to it real quick. So, um, like that on the map, and those are priority development areas. And so, one of the questions was, um, where where do these areas come from? You know, who decided on them? And the answer was, uh, this was uh, these areas were identified in a priority growth strategy. So, this was a comprehensive document that MVPC produced for the region. Um, that we uh, invited all of the municipalities to participate in, in order to help us understand where we want to see growth in the region. Like I said, housing doesn't stop at the municipal at municipal boundaries, and and neither does economic development. Neither does uh, you know the need for business parks. So these were uh, areas that we wanted to see some level of development happening. We know that our region is growing, which is a great thing. And so we wanted to be able to identify the places that we wanted to see that growth occur. So we relied on municipal input and we relied on public input to begin to identify those zones throughout the whole Merrimack Valley where we say, okay, given the fact that we're gonna to continue to grow, where do we wanna see that growth? And those blue areas were the spots that were identified uh, in that process. Um, any other questions? We've got five more minutes here. I'm uh, not opposed to ending a couple minutes early if, if we have run out of gas here, but I, I don't want to cut anybody off if anybody's got any last minute questions, comments, concerns, anything they want to uh, uh, throw out the panel here. Nate. While anybody uh, might be mustering up a last question, uh, I just wanted to take an opportunity to uh, thank you, uh, the whole team at MVPC, Ian Burns, you, uh, Tony and the whole group, uh, Christine from MHP, uh, all of our panelists, Deanna, Max, um, Jessica. Uh, well, unfortunately, we missed Jim tonight, um, but you guys were all awesome and I just wanted to Thank you all for um, putting on a great educational forum for our community. I really appreciate it. And of course, to Gene as well, my partner in crime. Um, everybody did a great job. So thank you very much for your time and effort in putting this together for the community.
Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. And yeah, everybody was super collaborative on this. And I, I hope to do this again in other communities. Um, we have a uh, another question that came in. And this might be a good one to end on. Can you discuss briefly housing demand versus housing supply? I don't know if there will be a brief answer to that in, in four minutes. But uh, does anybody want to take a stab at this one? I won't take a stab per se, but I do want to point back to, I think, a slide that both Christine or information that Christine had in one of her slides and that you, Nate, hit on. Um, and I, yeah, thank you. You're, you're doing me a service here by going back to one of them. But, but in a nutshell, it does speak to the fact that um, if you look at our, our population, um, here we go. You know, we have a rising population. Um, and, and in a nutshell, we have a, we have a majority of households that have one or two person, two, one or two people in it. Um, so you see, uh, as of 2019, you have a household size of one person, 24% of the, the, uh, the population, 30%, two people. Yet the unit sizes, we only have 1%, 1.1% 1 .1 studios, 10% bedrooms. Um, so that seems to me to be like a kind of a market failure of some sort, if you want to put it that way, where there's clearly not enough of those smaller size units to accommodate uh, the smaller person household sizes that are, we're seeing in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's a great answer to the, uh, to the housing supply versus demand issue. Um, but I think, I think that's certainly a telling statistic. Right, I think, and I think we've seen that throughout the state. Um, when they, when you look at state stats, and unfortunately, I don't have them uh, right here. Uh, you know, given population growth uh, that we've had in this state that we've been blessed with, and given housing production growth, there's a mismatch. Um, we simply have not been producing the housing units that we need to be producing in order to accommodate growth, uh, and and compounded by that is the housing we do produce tends to be three bedroom four bedroom subdivisions. So when you have increasing demand and when you particularly have increasing demand for those one, those studios, those one bedrooms, those two bedrooms, the prices of those products um, just skyrocket. And, you know, poke around on apartments.com, poke around on Craigslist, you, you can see the evidence right in there. These aren't cheap products um, to, to get. And they're not cheap because people can get away with charging a lot of money for them because a lot of folks need them. So, you know, uh, the, the quick and dirty of it is uh, we don't have enough. Um, and we've got a lot of people who need a lot of different products. And I will also just very briefly chime in here that we need housing production of all types. And I, I had spoken to this earlier about a frequently asked question if most of the units being built in North Andor are what we quote unquote call luxury units. But in fact, we need luxury, we need apartments, we need affordable, we need small, we need duplexes, triplexes, all sorts. Because if you're only producing market rate units and let alone not producing enough, the competition is really tight. And when the com competition is, is really tight, even for bigger homes, two, three, four bedroom homes, then the price uh, kind of overflows into the smaller units as well because the competition is even tighter there. So housing supply of all types of housing options is the quickest way to address the supply and demand issue. Um, I wanna thank everybody, we're at 7.30. Um, Thank you, Christine, Andrew, Jean, Deanna, Max, Tony, Ian. Um, I did get an email from Jim. He sent his apologies. He couldn't make it. Um, restaurant stuff, which no surprise. Uh, that's, that's, it's a tough industry to be in in the best of times. And it's an even tougher industry to be in now. So hats off to him. But um, I just want to thank all of our attendees for participating. Thank you for answering the poll questions and being candid with us in the, the Q&A section. Hope that this is useful. Uh, we, will, we have this recorded, so we're going to be pushing this out on social media channels. If you think folks should see it or if you found it useful or educational, share widely. 
Uh, you can reach out to any of us. Our emails are right there on the screen. Uh, if you've got a question, if you've got a comment, um, if you've got a concern, uh, you know, feel free to reach out and, uh, and thanks everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Great job, guys.